Hi, everyone. Welcome to Aurelian Coaching Weekly. My name is Nicole Coustier, and I'm your host. This week, we are talking about negotiations, and it's a very anxiety-inducing thing to have to prepare and go into a formal negotiation. But the reality is we're negotiating all the time. So what I want to talk about this week is a different approach to negotiation that is sort of <clears throat> not the traditional going into battle mentality. So this is considered a high EQ approach to negotiation, high emotional intelligence. And what it involves is leaving the battle armor at home and instead approaching negotiation with empathy, empathy for the other party. Okay, now stay with me. Has this ever happened to you? It's happened to me. It has happened to my colleagues. Even if you were not part of a negotiation, but you were uh, a, an observer, or you might have heard of these situations happening, when people spend a lot of time and energy and uh, you know just emotion into preparing for a negotiation, and then certainly all the time in the negotiation process, only to find out what? It crumbles at the end and everything breaks down. And sometimes in these situations, what I've heard is that people are very confused by the process, right? So have you ever heard of these situations where negotiations appear to be moving along just fine, just fine. In fact, people have a very good feeling about it. And then at the very, very end, when it comes time to sign on the dotted line or to formalize the agreement, people walk away. So what is happening there? Sometimes people say, it was for a thing that seemed so small or that it was a thing that the reason was a complete non sequitur, right? That it didn't seem related to all of the issues that they had been talking about during the course of the negotiation. So it seemed to come out of nowhere. What's happening there is that there wasn't any trust among the negotiating parties. Trust real trust, <laughs> true trust. So why is trust so important? Especially when people are approaching negotiation in a very traditional way, where it's us against them, or you're jockeying for position, and you have certain demands, you're coming to the table with demands, and you don't want to give an inch. Naturally, people feel, well, of course, there's not going to be trust, but you will get much more favorable outcomes if you are able to establish trust among all the negotiating parties. And the way to do that is, interestingly, through empathy. Now, a couple of things before I talk about how to do that. One is that you can be the only negotiating party bringing empathy to the table to get favorable results. Nobody else needs to do this, and you will still have a good outcome. Okay, Everybody else can be bringing their battle armor to the table, and you don't have to, and you will be able to create a very favorable environment to get favorable results. Okay, So that's number one. Number two, I'm not suggesting that the preparation is any different. You still have to know where you stand. What's your floor? What's your ceiling? Um, you have to know what your demands are. You have to go through all the documentation with a fine tooth comb. Uh, you have to prepare point, counterpoint. All of that stuff still stands. But here's the difference. When you finally sit down to the negotiating table, you leave all that stuff at the door. 
just leave it at the door at first, okay? Another thing that you're gonna try to do is leave your ego at the door. <laughs> that might be harder, <laughs> okay? And again, everybody else might be bringing their, they might be ready for battle, you might be dealing with huge egos across the table from you. But what you're going to do is you're going to approach this with empathy and active listening. You're gonna put all of your demands aside to begin with, and you're gonna focus on the other party. And what you are going to try to do is present yourself as being truly, genuinely interested and curious about their position, where they are coming from, what their greatest concerns are, what is keeping them up at night about this whole thing, okay? You are going to try to unearth that. You are going to practice active listening, right? What I'm hearing you say is this. You're going to demonstrate to the other party that you have, not just that you're hearing them, right? So it's not just nodding, right? It is demonstrating through your behavior and your words that you have an understanding and an appreciation for their position, okay? When you do that, a couple of things happen. Number one, there's this cascading effect. Number one, you're creating a safe place for them where they feel, oh, I, they're genuinely interested in, in hearing my side of this, so I'm gonna explain my side of this. Once you create an environment of safety, you actually get some trust. You get some honesty and some truth put out on the table, okay? And even if the other party is a little bit resistant, remember, you can use active listening to te techniques to try and draw that out, right? You can try to read between the lines and say, it seems to me that this is a big concern of yours. Or I'm reading between the lines and what I'm hearing is the underlying issue is X, Y, and Z. Because when you do that, you can get the other party to validate and confirm that that is the real concern. Or you can get them to clarify and say, well, that's not exactly it, but this is what's really bothering me about this whole thing. When negotiations break down at the end, and it feels like they broke down for some random reason, it's because all of those little things that were truly underlying issues were never surfaced, okay? The sooner you can establish a safe environment for the other party to be honest, and you can validate what the real issues are, guess what? You can address them. <laughs> you can address them right off the bat. You can address them sooner, rather than continuing to engage in a false environment, you know, where things seem to be going well, but you haven't really validated your assumptions about, you know, how, are we really talking? about the, the core issues and getting to the bottom of it. <clears throat> so that's what an, a high EQ approach to negotiation is, right? Once you can validate what the other party's greatest concerns are, you now have the opportunity. You've given yourself the opportunity to address those things right up front, okay? And that, when you create that favorable environment, now you've created an opportunity for discussions to go forward in a truly meaningful way. Then all that prep that you left at the door, now you bring that in. Now you bring that in because what you're really talking about, you know, the give and take and point counterpoint, now there's trust. You guys can be open about what the concerns are, and address a work together to address those things. And people aren't holding back and uh, potentially sabotaging the negotiations 
much, much later. Okay, so that is this week's guidance on the high EQ approach to negotiation. So if you are looking for a tool, I have a one page worksheet that will walk you through this process and help you get prepared. How do you think about uh, emotional the emotional intelligence approach to negotiation? What are some of the questions? What are some of the strategies that you could employ? If you're interested in getting that, go to aureliancoaching.com. At the very top, you can put in your email address and then you'll get that worksheet uh, totally for free. Uh, sign up by tomorrow because the worksheet is going out to mass email tomorrow. So if you want to make sure you get it, sign up uh, today or tomorrow and we'll make sure that you get that. Okay, next week, um, we are going to be talking about a networking issue. So as I've been interviewing a number of people on what their greatest pain points are as it relates to networking, business networking, a lot of people have concerns about how to start conversations and how to position themselves and all of that kind of stuff, but there's a totally different set of concerns that has to do with uh, folks who have no problem making those initial connections, but then they're really bad at keeping those connections warm. So, you know, people will go to a meeting or conference and then they'll have all these LinkedIn contacts, they'll get 50 LinkedIn contacts, and then they never talk to them again. And so the question is, how do you do really good follow-up in a meaningful way? How do you cultivate meaningful business relationships and keep those relationships warm in a way that is not burdensome to your existing schedule and doesn't take a whole lot of heavy lifting to do? So I'll be providing some strategies on that next week. Until then, I hope this was helpful. Have a great week, and I'll see you back here next week. Take care. Bye-bye.